Ulysses, Book Two, Chapter Five, by James Joyce. By lorries along Sir Rogerson's quay, Mr. Bloom walked soberly, past Windmill Lane, Leeks, the linseed crusher, the postal telegraph office. Could have given that address, too, and past the sailor's home. He turned from the morning noises of the quayside and walked through Lime Street. By Brady's cottages, a boy for the skins lolled, his bucket of offal linked, smoking a chewed fag butt. A smaller girl with scars of eczema on her forehead eyed him, listlessly holding her battered cask hoop. Tell him if he smokes, he won't grow. Oh, let him. His life isn't such a bed of roses. Waiting outside pubs to bring Da home. Come home to Ma, Da. Slack hour. Won't be many there. He crossed Townsend Street, past the frowning face of Bethel, El, yes, house of, Aleph, Beth, and past Nichols, the undertaker. At eleven it is, time enough. Dare say Corny Keller bagged the job for O'Neill's, singing with his eyes shut. Corny. Met her once in the park, in the dark. What a lark. Police tout. Her name and address she then told with my touralum touralum te. Oh, surely he bagged it. Bury him cheap in a whatchamacall. With my touralum 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 touralum. In Westland Row, he halted before the window of the Belfast and Oriental Tea Company and read the legends of lead-papered packets, choice blend, finest quality, family tea, rather warm tea, must get some from Tom Kernan. Couldn't ask him at a funeral, though. While his eyes still read blandly, he took off his hat quietly inhaling his hair oil and sent his right hand with slow grace over his brow and hair. Very warm morning. Under their dropped lids, his eyes found the tiny bow of the leather headband inside his high-grade hat. Just there. His right hand came down into the bowl of his hat. His fingers found quickly a card behind the headband and transferred it to his waistcoat pocket. So warm. His right hand once more slowly went over his brow and hair. Then he put on his hat again, relieved, and read again, choice blend, made of the finest Ceylon brands, the Far East, lovely spot it must be, the garden of the world, big lazy leaves to float about on, cactuses, flowery meads, sneaky lianas they call them. Wonder, is it like that? Those singalese lobbing about in the sun, in dolce far niente, not doing a hand's turn all day. Sleep six months out of twelve. Too hot to quarrel, influence of the climate, lethargy, flowers of idleness, the air feeds most, azotes, hothouse and botanic gardens, sensitive plants, water lilies, petals too tired to, sleeping sickness in the air. Walk on rose leaves. Imagine trying to eat tripe and cow heel. Where was the chap I saw in that picture somewhere? Ah, yes, in the Dead Sea, floating on his back, reading a book with a parasol open. Couldn't sink it if you tried, so thick with salt. Because the weight of the water, no, the weight of the body in the water is equal to the weight of the what? Or is it the volume is equal to the weight? It's a law, something like that. Vance in high school, cracking his finger joints, teaching. The college curriculum. Cracking curriculum. What is weight, really, when you say the weight? 32 feet per second per second, law of falling bodies, per second per second, they all fall to the ground, the earth. It's the force of gravity of the earth is the weight. He turned away and sauntered across the road. How did she walk with her sausages? Like that something. And he walked. As he walked, he took the folded freeman from his side pocket, unfolded it, rolled it lengthwise in a baton and tapped it at each sauntering step against his trouser leg. Careless air, just drop in to see, per second, per second. Per second for every second it means. From the curbstone he darted a keen glance through the door of the post office. Too late box. Post here. No one. In. He handed the card through the brass grill. 
Are there any letters for me? he asked. While the postmistress searched a pigeonhole, he gazed at the recruiting poster with soldiers of all arms on parade and held the tip of his baton against his nostrils, smelling fresh printed rag paper. No answer, probably. Went too far last time. The postmistress handed him back through the grill his card with a letter. He thanked her and glanced rapidly at the typed envelope. Henry Flower, Esquire, in care of post office West Row, City. Answered anyhow. He slipped card and letter into his side pocket, reviewing again the soldiers on parade. Where's old Tweedy's regiment? Cast off soldier. There, bearskin cap and hackle plume. No, he's a grenadier. Pointed cuffs. There he is. Royal Dublin Fusiliers, red coats, too showy. That must be why the women go after them. Uniform. Easier to enlist in drill. Maud Gon's letter about them taking off O'Connell Street at night. Disgrace to our Irish capital. Griffith's paper is on the same tack now. An army rotten with venereal disease. Overseas or half seas over empire. Half baked they looked. Hypnotized like. Eyes front, mark time, table, able, bed, ed, the king's own. Never see him dressed up as a fireman or a bobby. A mason, yes. He strolled out of the post office and turned to the right. Talk as if that would mend matters. His hand went into his pocket and a forefinger felt its way under the flap of the envelope, ripping it open in jerks. Women will pay a lot of heed, I don't think. His fingers drew forth the letter and crumpled the envelope in his pocket. Something pinned on. Photo, perhaps. Hair? No. McCoy. Get rid of him quickly. Take me out of my way. He'd company when you. Hello, Bloom. Where are you off to? Hello, McCoy. Nowhere in particular. How's the body? Fine. How are you? Just keeping alive, McCoy said. His eyes on the black tie and clothes he asked with low respect. Is there any... No trouble, I hope. I see your... Oh, no, Bloom said. Poor Dignam, you know. The funeral's today. To be sure, poor fellow. So it is. What time? A photo it isn't. A badge, maybe. Eleven, Mr. Bloom answered. I must try to get out there, McCoy said. Eleven, is it? I only heard it last night. Who's telling me? Hollahan. You know Hoppy? I know. Mr. Bloom gazed across the road at the outsider drawn up before the door of the Grosvenor. The porter hoisted the valise up on the well. She stood still, waiting, while the man, husband, brother, like her, searched his pockets for change. Stylish kind of coat with that roll collar, warm for a day like this. Looks like blanket cloth. Careless stand of her with her hands in those patch pockets, like that haughty creature at the polo match. Women all for cast till you touch the spot. Handsome is and handsome does, reserved about to yield. The Honorable Mrs. and Brutus is an honorable man. Possess her once. Take the starch out of her. I was with Bob Doran. He's on one of those periodical bends. And what do you call them? Bantam Lions. Just down there in Conway's we were. Doran Lyons and Conway's. She raised a gloved hand to her hair. In came Hoppy, having a wet, drawing back his head and gazing far from beneath his veiled eyelids. He saw the bright fawn skin shine in the glare, the braided drums. Clearly, I can see today. Moisture about gives long sight, perhaps. Talking of one thing or another. Lady's hand. Which side will she get up? And he said, Sad thing about our poor friend Paddy. What Paddy, I said. Poor little Paddy Dingham, he said. Off to the country, Broadstone probably. High brown boots with laces dangling. Well turned foot. What is he foostering over that change for? Sees me looking. Eye out for the other fellows always. Could fall back. Two strings to her bow. Why, I say. What's wrong with him, I said. Proud, rich, silk stockings. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He moved a little to the side of McCoy's talking head, getting up in a minute. What's wrong with him, he said. He's dead, he said. And faith he filled up. 
Is it Paddy Dingham? I said. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I was with him no later than Friday last, or Thursday, was it, in the arch? Yes, he said, he's gone. He died on Monday, poor fellow. Watch, watch. Silk flash, rich stockings, white. Watch. A heavy tram car honking, its gong slewed between. Lost it. Curse your noisy pug nose. Feels locked out of it. Paradise and the Perry always happening like that. The very moment. Girl in Eustace Street, hallway Monday, was it? Settling her garter. Her friend covering the display of esprit de corps. Well, what are you gaping at? Yes, yes, Mr. Bloom said after a dull sigh. Another gone. One of the best, McCoy said. The tram passed. They drove off towards the loop line bridge. Her rich, gloved hand on the steel grip. Flicker, flicker. The lace flare of her hat in the sun. Flicker, flick. Wife well, I suppose, McCoy's changed voice said. Oh, yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tip top, thanks. He unrolled the newspaper baton idly and read idly. What is home without plum trees potted meat, incomplete, with it an abode of bliss? My missus has just got an engagement. At least, it's not settled yet. Please tack again. By the way, no harm. I'm off that, thanks. Mr. Bloom turned his large lidded eyes with unhasty friendliness. My wife, too, he said. She's going to sing at a swagger affair in the Ulster Hall, Belfast, on the 25th. That's so? McCoy said. Glad to hear that, old man. Who's getting it up? Mrs. Marion Bloom, not up yet. Queen was in her bedroom eating bread and no book. Blackened court cards laid along her thigh by sevens. Dark lady and fair man, letter, cat furry black ball, torn strip of envelope. Love's old sweet song comes love's old. It's kind of a tour, don't you see, Mr. Bloom said thoughtfully. Sweet song. There's a committee formed, part shares and part profits. McCoy nodded, picking at his mustache stubble. Oh, well, he said. That's good news. He moved to go. Well, glad to see you looking fit, he said. Meet you knocking around. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tell you what, McCoy said. You might be put down my name at the funeral, will you? I'd like to go, but I mightn't be able to, you see. There's a drowning case at Sandy Cove may turn up, and then the coroner myself would have to go down if the body is found. You just shove in my name if I'm not there, will you? I'll do that, Mr. Bloom said, moving on to get off. That'll be all right. Right, McCoy said brightly. Thanks, old man. I'd go if I possibly could. Well, tolol, just CP, McCoy will do. That will be done, Mr. Bloom answered firmly. Didn't catch me napping that wheeze. That quick touch, soft mark. I'd like my job. The lease I have a particular fancy for. Leather. Capped corners, riveted edges, double action lever lock. Bob Coley lent him his for the Wicklow Regatta concert last year and never heard tidings of it from that good day to this. Mr. Bloom, strolling towards Brunswick Street, smiled. My missus has got an reedy freckled soprano. Cheese paring nose, nice enough in its way, for a little ballad, no guts in it. You and me, don't you know, in the same boat, soft sopping. Give you the needle that would. Can't he hear the difference? Think he's that way inclined a bit, against my grain somehow. Thought that Belfast would fetch him. I suppose that smallpox up there doesn't get worse. Suppose she wouldn't let herself be vaccinated again. Your wife and my wife. Wonder if he's pimping after me. Mr. Bloom stood at the corner, his eyes wandering over the multicolored hoardings. Cantrell and Cochrane's ginger ale, aromatic. Clary's summer sale, no, he's going on straight. Hello, Leia tonight, Mrs. Banman Palmer. I'd like to see her again in that. Hamlet she played last night, male impersonator. Perhaps he was a woman. Why Ophelia committed suicide, poor papa. How he used to talk of Cateman. In that, outside the Adelphi in London, waited all the afternoon to get in. Year before I was born, that was, 65. And Ristory in Vienna. What is this the right name is? By Mosenthal it is. 
Rachel, is it? No. The scene he was always talking about where the old blind Abraham recognizes the voice and puts his fingers on his face. Nathan's voice, his son's voice. I hear the voice of Nathan who left his father to die of grief and misery in my arms, who left the house of his father and left the God of his father. Every word is so deep, Leopold. Poor Papa, poor man. I'm glad I didn't go into that room to look at his face. That day, oh dear, oh dear. Whew. Well, perhaps it was best for him. Mr. Bloom went around the corner and past the drooping nags of the hazard. No use thinking of it anymore. Nosebag time. Wish I hadn't met that McCoy fellow. He came nearer and heard a crunching of the gilded oats, the gently champing teeth, their full buck eyes regarding him as he went by amid the sweet oaken reek of horse piece. Their El Dorado, poor jugginses, damn all they know or care about anything with their long noses stuck in nose bags. Too full for words. Still, they get their feet all right, and their dos. Gilded, too, a stump of black gutter percha wagging limp between their haunches. Might be happy all the same that way. Good poor brutes they look. Still, their nay can be very irritating. He drew the letter from his pocket and folded it into the newspaper he carried. Might just walk into her here. The lane is safer. He passed the cabin's shelter. Curious the life of drifting cabbies, all weathers, all places, time or set down, no will of their own, volio et non. Like to give them an odd cigarette, sociable. Shot a few flying syllables as they pass. He hummed, la, la si daram la mano, la 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 la. He turned into Cumberland Street and going on some paces halted in the lee of the station wall. No one. Mead's timber yard, piled bulks, ruins and tenements. With careful tread he passed over a hopscotch court with its forgotten picky stone. Not a sinner. Near the timber yard a squatted child at marbles, alone, shooting the taw with a cunny thumb. A wise tabby, a blinking sphinx, watched from her warm sill. Pity to disturb them. Mohammed cut a piece out of his mantle not to wake her. Open it. And once I played marbles when I went to that old dame school. She liked mignonette. Mrs. Ellis's. And Mr.? He opened the letter within the newspaper. A flower. I think it's a. A yellow flower with flattened petals. Not annoyed then. What does she say? Dear Henry... I got your last letter to me, and thank you very much for it. I am sorry you did not like my last letter. Why did you enclose the stamps? I'm awfully angry with you. I do wish I could punish you for that. I called you naughty boy because I do not like that other word. Please tell me what it is, the real meaning of that word. Are you not happy in your home, you poor little naughty boy? I do wish I could do something for you. Please tell me. What do you think of poor me? I often think of the beautiful name you have. Dear Henry, when will we meet? I think of you so often you have no idea. I have never felt myself so much drawn to a man as you. I feel so bad about. Please, write me a long letter and tell me more. Please, if you do not, I will punish you. So now you know what I will do to you, you naughty boy, if you do not wrote. Oh, how I long to meet you. Henry, dear, do not deny my request before my patients are exhausted. Then I will tell you all. Goodbye now, naughty darling. I have such a bad headache today. And write by return to your longing. Martha, P.S. Do tell me what kind of perfume does your wife use. I want to know. He tore the flower gravely from its pinhole, smelt its almost no smell, and placed it in his heart pocket. Language of flowers. They like it because no one can hear. Or a poison bouquet to strike him down. Then walking slowly forward, he read the letter again, murmuring here and there a word. Angry tulips with you, darling man-flower. Punish your cactus if you don't. Please, poor, forget me not. How I long, violets, to dear roses, when we soon an enemy... Meet all naughty night stalk wife Martha's perfume. Having read it all, he took it from the newspaper and put it back in his side pocket. Weak joy opened his lips, changed since the first letter. Wonder, did she wrote it herself? 
doing the indignant, a girl of good family like me, respectable character. Could meet one Sunday after the rosary. Thank you, not having any. Usual love scrimmage. The running around corners, bad as a row with Molly. Cigar has a cooling effect. Narcotic. Go further next time. Naughty boy. Punish. Afraid of words, of course. Brutal. Why not? Try it anyway, a bit at a time. Fingering still the letter in his pocket, he drew the pin out of it. Come and pin, eh? He threw it on the road, out of her clothes somewhere, pinned together. Queer the number of pins they always have. No roses without thorns. Flat Dublin voices bawled in his head. Those two sluts that night in the coom, linked together in the rain. Oh, Mary lost the pin of her drawer. She didn't know what to do to keep it up, to keep it up. It, them, such a bad headache. Has her roses, probably. Or sitting all day typing, I focus bad for stomach nerves. What perfume does your wife use? Now, could you make out a thing like that? To keep it up. Martha, Mary. I saw that picture somewhere, I forget now, old master or faked for money. He is sitting in their house talking, mysterious. Also, the two slots in the coom would listen. Nice kind of evening feeling. No more wandering about, just loll there, quiet dusk. Let everything rip. Forget. Tell about places you have been, strange customs. The other one, jar on her head, was getting the supper. Fruits, olives, lovely cool water out of a well, stone cold like the hole in the wall at Ashtown. Must carry a paper goblet next time I go to the trotting matches. She listens with big, dark, soft eyes. Tell her, more and more, all, then a sigh, silence, long, long rest. Going under the railway arch, he took out the envelope, tore it swiftly in shreds, and scattered them towards the road. The shreds fluttered away, sank in the dank air, a white flutter, then all sank. Henry Flower. You could tear up a cheque for a hundred pounds in the same way. Simple bit of paper. Lord Eve once cashed a seven-figure cheque for a million in the Bank of Ireland. Shows you the money to be made out of porter. Still, the other brother, Lord... Adderlon had to change his shirt four times a day, they say. Skin breeds lice or vermin. A million pounds. Wait a moment. Two pence a pint, four pence a quart, eight pence a gallon of porter. No, one and four pence a gallon of, quart of porter. One and four and twenty, fifteen about. Yes, exactly. Fifteen millions of barrels of porter. What am I saying? Barrels? Gallons? About a million barrels, all the same. An incoming train clanked heavily above his head, couch after couch. Barrels bumped in his head, dull porters slopped and churned inside. The bungholes sprang open and a huge dull flood leaked out, flowing together, winding through mud flats all over the level land. A lazy, pooling swirl of liquor bearing along wide-leaved flowers of its froth. He had reached the open back door of all hollows. Stepping into the porch, he doffed his hat, took the card from his pocket, and tucked it again behind the leather headband. Damn it. I might have tried to work McCoy for a pass to Mullingar. Same notice on the door. Sermon by the very Reverend John Comey, S.J., on St. Peter Claver, S.J., and the African Mission. Prayers for the conversion of Gladstone they had, too, when he was almost unconscious. The Protestants are the same. Convert Dr. William J. Wash D.D. to the true religion. Save China's millions. Wonder how they explain it to the heathen Chinese. Prefer an ounce of opium. Celestials rank heresy for them. Buddha, their god, lying on his side in the museum, taking it easy with his hand under his cheek. Jaw sticks burning, not like Eche Homo. Crown of thorns and cross. Clever idea, St. Patrick the Shamrock. Chopsticks. Con me. Martin Cunningham knows him. Distinguished looking. Sorry, I didn't work him about getting Molly into the choir instead of that Father Farley who looked a fool but wasn't. They're taught that. He's not going out in bluey specks with the sweat rolling off him to baptize blacks, is he? The glasses would take their fancy flashing. I'd like to see them sitting around. In a ring with blub lips, entranced, listening, still life, lap it up like milk, I suppose. The cold smell of sacred stone called him. He trod the worn steps, pushed the swing door, and entered softly by the rear. 
something going on, some sodality. Pity so empty. Nice, discreet place to be next, some girl. Who's my neighbor? Jam by the hour to slow music. That woman at midnight mass, seventh heaven. Women knelt in the benches with crimson halters around their necks, heads bowed. A batch knelt at the altar rails. The priest went along by them, murmuring, holding the thing in his hands. He stopped at each, took out a communion, shook a drop or two, are they in water, off it, and put it neatly into her mouth. Her hat and head sank, then the next one. Her hat sank at once, then the next, murmuring all the time. A small old woman, the priest bent down to put it in her mouth. Latin. The next one. Shut your eyes and open your mouth. What? Corpus. Body. Corpse. Good idea, said the Latin. Stupefies them first. Hospice for the dying. They don't seem to chew it, only to swallow it down. Rum idea, eating bits of a corpse. Why, the cannibals cotton to it. He stood outside, watching their blank masks pass down the aisle one by one and seek their places. He approached a bench and seated himself in its corner, nursing his hat and newspaper. These pots we have to wear. We ought to have hats modeled on our heads. They were about him here and there, with heads still bowed in their crimson halters, waiting for it to melt in their stomachs. Something like those mazoth. It's that sort of bread. Unleavened shoe bread. Look at them. Now I bet it makes them feel happy. Lollipop, it does. Yes, bread of angels, it's called. There's a big idea behind it. Kind of kingdom of God is within you feel. First communicants. Hokey pokey penny a lump. Then feel all like one family party, same in the theater, all in the same swim. They do. I'm sure of that. Not so lonely. In our confraternity. Then comes out a bit spreeish, let off steam. Thing is, if you really believe in it, Lord is cure, waters of oblivion, and the knock apparition, statues bleeding. Our fellow is asleep near that confession box. Hence those snores, blind faith. Safe in the arms of kingdoms come, lulls all pain. Wake this time next year. He saw the priest now. Stow the communion cup away, well in, and kneel an instant before it, showing a large gray boot sole from under the lace affair he had on. Suppose he lost the pin of his, he wouldn't know what to do. Bald spot behind, letters on his back, I-N-R-I. No, I-H-S. Molly told me one time I asked her, I have sinned. No, I have suffered, it is. And the other one? Iron nails ran in. Meet one Sunday after the rosary. Do not deny my request. Turn up with a veil and black bag. Dusk and light behind her. She might be here with a ribbon round her neck and do the other thing all the same on the sly. Their character. That fellow that turned Queen's evidence on the invincibles he used to receive. The carrier was his name, the communion. Every morning. This very church. Peter Carey, yes. No, Peter Claver I'm thinking of. Dennis Carey. And just imagine that. Wife and six children at home and plotting that murder all the time. Those craw-thumpers, now that's a good name for them. There's always something shifty-looking about them. They're not straight men of business, either. Oh, no. She's not here. The flower. No, no. By the way, did I tear up that envelope? Yes, under the bridge. The priest was rinsing out the chalice. Then he tossed off the dregs smartly. Wine. Makes it more aristocratic than for some, if he drank what they are used to. Guinness porters or some temperance beverage, Wheatley's Dublin hop bitters or Cantrell and Cochran's ginger ale or aromatic. Doesn't give them any of it. Show wine. Only the other. Cold comfort. Pious fraud, but quite right. Otherwise they'd have one old boozer worse than another coming along, catching for a drink. Queer the whole atmosphere of the... Quite right. Perfectly right, that is. Mr. Bloom looked back towards the choir. Not going to be any music. Pity. Who has the organ here, I wonder? Old Glynn, he knew how to make that instrument talk. Vibrato. Fifty pounds a year, they say, he had in the Gardner Street. Molly was in fine voice that day. The Stabat Mater of Rossini. 
Father Bernard Vaughan's sermon first. Christ or Pilate? Christ. But don't keep us all night over it. Music they wanted. Foot drill stopped. Could hear a pin drop. I told her to pitch her voice against that corner. I could feel the thrill in the air. The full. The people looking up. Qui est homo? Some of that old sacred music splendid. Mercandante, seven last words. Mozart's twelfth mass. Gloria in that. Those old popes keen on music, on art and statues, and pictures of all kinds. Palestrina, for example, too. They had a gay old time while it lasted. Healthy, too, chanting, regular hours, then brew liquors. Benedictine, green chartreuse. Still, having eunuchs in their choir with... That was coming at a big thick. What kind of a voice is it? Must be curious to hear after their own strong basses. Connoisseurs. Suppose they wouldn't feel anything after. Kind of a placid. Mm, no worry. Fall into flesh, don't they? Gluttons, tall, long legs. Who knows? Eunuch. One way out of it. He saw the priest bend down and kiss the altar and then face about and bless all the people. All crossed themselves and stood up. Mr. Bloom glanced about him and then looked up looking over the rising hats. Stand up at the gospel, of course, then all settled down on their knees again, and he sat back quietly in his bench. The priest came down from the altar, holding the thing out from him, and he and the mass boy answered each other in Latin. Then the priest knelt down and began to read off a card. O oh God, our refuge and our strength. Mr. Bloom put his face forward to catch the words. English. Throw them the bone. I remember slightly. How long since your last mass? Glorious and immaculate virgin. Joseph, her spouse. Peter and Paul. More interesting if you understood what it was all about. Wonderful organization. Certainly goes like clockwork. Confession. Everyone wants to. Then I will tell you all. Penance. Punish me, please. Great weapon in their hands. More than doctor or solicitor. Women dying to. And I, shh, 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 shh. And did you, cha, 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 And why did you? Look down at her ring to find an excuse. Whispering gallery walls have ears. Husbands learn to his surprise. God's little joke. Then out she comes. Repentance, skin deep. Lovely shame. Pray at an altar. Hail Mary and Holy Mary. Flowers, incense, candles melting. Hide her blushes. Salvation army blatant imitation. Reformed prostitute will address the meeting. How I found the Lord. Square-headed chaps there must be in Rome. They work the whole show. And don't they rake in the money, too? Bequests also to the PP for the saint, for the time being, in his absolute discretion. Masses for the repose of my soul to be said publicly with open doors, monasteries and convents. The priest in that fermana will case in the witness box. No browbeating him. He had his answer pat for everything. Liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother, the Church. The doctors of the Church, they mapped out the whole theology of it. The priest prayed, Blessed Michael, Archangel, Defend us in the hour of our conflict. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God restrain him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust Satan down to hell, and with him those other wicked spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. The priest and the mass boy stood up and walked off. All over. The women remained behind. Thanksgiving. Better be shoving along. Brother Buzz, come around with the plate, perhaps. Pay your Easter duty. He stood up. Hello. Were those two buttons of my waistcoat open all time? Women enjoy it. Never tell you. But we? Excuse, miss, there's a whoo, just a whoo, fluff. Or their skirt behind, placket unhooked, glimpses of the moon. Annoyed if you don't. Why didn't you tell me before? Still, like you better, untidy. Good job it wasn't for the south. He passed, discreetly buttoning down the aisle and through the main door into the light. He stood a moment unseeing by the cold black marble bowl, while before him and behind two worshippers dipped furtive hands in the low tide of holy water. Trams, a car of Prescott's dye works. 
a widow in her weeds. Notice because I'm in mourning myself. He covered himself. How goes the time? Quarter past. Time enough yet. Better get that lotion made up. Where is this? Ah, yes, the last time. Sweeney's in Lincoln's place. Chemists rarely move. Their green and gold beacon jars too heavy to stir. Hamilton Longs, found in the year of the flood. Huygenot churchyard near there. Visit some day. He walks southward along Westland Row. But the recipe's in the other trousers. Oh, and I forgot that latch key, too. Bore this funeral affair. Oh, well, poor fellow, it's not his fault. When was it I got it made up last? Wait. I changed a sovereign, I remember. First of the month it must have been, or the second. Oh, he can look it up in the prescriptions book. The chemist turned back page after page. Sandy, shriveled smell he seems to have. Shrunken skull and old. Quest for the philosopher's stone. The alchemist. Drugs aid you after mental excitement. Lethargy, then. Why? Reaction. A lifetime in a night gradually changes your character living all the day among herbs, ointments, disinfectants, all his alabaster lily pots, mortar and pestle. Ac dist fall lor. Tevirid. Smell almost cure you like dentist doorbell. Dr. Wack. He ought to physic himself a bit. Electuary or emulsion. The first fellow that picked an herb to cure himself had a bit of pluck. Simples. Want to be careful. Enough stuff here to chloroform you. Test. Turns blue litmus paper red. Chloroform. Overdose of laudanum. Sleeping droughts, love filters, paragoric poppy syrup, bad for cough. Clogs the pores or the phlegm. Poison's the only cure. Remedy. Where you least expect it. Clever of nature. About a fortnight ago, sir. Yes. Mr. Bloom said. He waited by the counter, inhaling slowly the keen reek of drugs, the dusty dry smell of sponges and loofahs. A lot of time taken up telling your aches and pains. Sweet almond oil and a tincture of benzoin, Mr. Bloom said. And then orange flower water. It certainly did make her skin so delicate white, like wax. And white wax also, he said. Brings out the darkness of her eyes, looking at me, the sheet up to her eyes, Spanish, smelling herself. When I was fixing the link in my cuffs, those homely recipes are often the best. Strawberries for the teeth, nettles and rainwater, oatmeal, they say, steeped in buttermilk, skin food. One of those old queens' sons, Duke of Albany, was it, had only one skin. Leopold, yes, three we have, warts, bunions, and pimples to make it worse, but you want a perfume, too. What perfume does your Pau d'Espagne, that orange flower water so fresh? I smell these soaps have, pure curd soap. Time to get a bath around the corner. Hammam, Turkish, massage. Dirt gets rolled up into your navel. Nicer, if a nice girl did it. Also, I think I, yes, I, do it in the bath. Curious longing, I, water to water, combine business with pleasure. Pity no time for massage. Feel fresh then all the day. Funeral. Be rather glum. Yes, sir, the chemist said. That was two and nine. Have you brought a bottle? No, Mr. Bloom said. Make it up, please. I'll call later in the day and I'll take one of these soaps. How much are they? Four pence, sir. Bloom raised a cake to his nostrils. Sweet lemony wax. I'll take this one, he said. That makes three and a penny. Yes, sir. The chemist said, You can pay altogether, sir, when you come back. Good, Mr. Bloom said. He strolled out of the shop, the newspaper baton under his armpit, the cool wrap soap in his left hand. At his armpit, Baton Lion's voice and hand said, Hello, Bloom. What's the best news? Is that today's? Show us a minute. Shaved off his mustache again by Jove, long, cold upper lip to look younger. He does look balmy. Younger than I am. Baton Lion's yellow-black nailed fingers unrolled the baton. Wants a wash, too. Takes off the rough dirt. Good morning. Have you used pear soap? Dandruff on his shoulders. Scalp wants oiling. I want to see about that French horse that's running today, Bantam Lion said. 
Where the bugger is it? He rustled the pleated pages, jerking his chin on his high collar. Barber's itch. Tight collar, he'll lose his hair. Better leave him the paper and get shut of him. You can keep it, Mr. Bloom said. Ascot. Gold cup. Wait, Phantom Lions mutter. Half a mo. Maximum the second. I was just going to throw it away, Mr. Bloom said. Phantom Lyons raised his eyes suddenly and leered weakly. What's that? His sharp voice said. I say you can keep it, Mr. Bloom answered. I was going to throw it away that moment. Phantom Lyons doubted an instant, leering, then thrust the outspread sheets back on Mr. Bloom's arms. I'll risk it, he said. Here, thanks. He sped off towards Conway's corner. Godspeed, Scott. Mr. Bloom folded the sheets again to a neat square and lodged the soap in it, smiling. Silly lips of that chap, bedding. Regular hot bed of it lately. Messenger boys stealing to put on six pence. Raffle for large tender turkey. Your Christmas dinner for three pence. Jack Fleming embezzling to gamble, then smuggled off to America. Keeps a hotel now. They never come back. Flesh pots of Egypt. He walked cheerfully towards the mosque of the baths. Remind you of a mosque. Red baked bricks. The minarets. College sports today, I see. He eyed the horse shoe poster over the gate of College Park. Cyclists doubled up like a cod in a pot. Damn bad ad. Now, if they had made it round like a wheel, then the spoke, sports, 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 and the big hub, big college. Something to catch the eye. There's Hornblower standing at the porter's lodge. Keep him on hands. Might take a turn in there on the nod. How do you do, Mr. Hornblower? How do you do, sir? Heavenly weather, really. If life was always like this. Cricket weather. Sit around under sunshades. Over after over. Out. They can't play it here. Duck for six wickets. Still, Captain Culler broke a window in the Kildare Street Club with a slog to square leg. Donnybrook Fair more in their line. And the skulls we were a-cracking when McCarthy took the floor. Heat wave. Won't last. Always passing. The stream of life. Which in the stream of life we trace is dearer than the mole. Enjoy a bath now. Clean trough of water. Cool enamel. The gentle tepid steam. This is my body. He foresaw his pale body reclined in at full naked in a womb of warmth, oiled by scented melting soap, softly laved. He saw his trunk and limbs rip-rippled over and sustained, buoyed lightly upward, lemon yellow, his navel but a flesh and saw the dark, tangled curls of his bush floating, floating hair of the stream around the limp father of thousands, a languid, floating flower. <laughs>